guys ready for the word today? Stand to your feet. Come on, if you have the ability, get up on your feet. Let's honor the Lord. And let's welcome and invite the Holy Spirit to come and teach us today. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful. God, we come alive in your presence. And we thank you, Lord, for just the joy of the Lord that's in this place today, God. We're so honored that you would come and that you would minister to our hearts today. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher, be our guide, give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives, Lord. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. Truly today, Lord, we recognize that we're not here to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. We've come to hear from you. So welcome, Holy Spirit. You do your part, God. We know that you will. You're faithful, God. We'll do our part, opening our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are both preaching and hearing the gospel. Lord, if they're lifting up your name, preaching your truth, God, they're our brothers and our sisters, and we bless them, Lord. We bless the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Episcopalians, and the Charismatics. Pentecostals, God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel and Harvest and for Oak Valley, for the Way, God, and Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, God, for the four square denominations, God, and the Assemblies of God, Lord, for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord. They're preaching your truth, God. We bless them as you would bless us. Also, Lord, we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world, Lord. We lift them up to you, God, and ask that you encourage them, that you strengthen them, that you deliver them, Lord. You heal them, God, and may they endure to the end to the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, Amen. 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 Today, as you're having a seat, let me just tell you a couple quick things. I want you to just rule out distractions. So if you've got your cell phone, you've got your iPad, you're going to use that for your device. That's cool. Just turn off the sound, okay, and make sure that you're uh, turning off notifications. God's going to speak to you today as well. I see the family rooms are full. Hey, you guys, wave at me over here in the family room. Love you guys. All right, over here on this side, wave at me. You guys, love you guys. Make that about a two-week experience. You don't want to be sitting there, okay? I know your kid might be sick, might have the runny nose, and so they can't go over there. That's cool. Once they get better, take them back over to the children's ministry as well. If you're checking us out, make that about a two-week experience while you get comfortable. Then get your children into the greatest children's ministry on the planet, and you get a front row seat up here where you can get the Word of God at your level. Amen? All right. Today, this is part number five of the series we've been in called Humble Faith. Now, don't worry if you missed some of the earlier parts. This message stands alone today, and you'll be able to get something from God right where we're going today. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, really, when you take a look at it, many scholars have called this the Hall of Faith. We see great and mighty men and women who did great and mighty things for God, and what it came down to was their faith in who God is and what God's ability was. And now we come to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and starting verse number 32, and we see these words in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse number 32, and it says, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah. What great messages those were, weren't they? Just, just outstanding. Last week, how many of you guys heard the message on Jephthah from Pastor Jim? Wasn't that, oh my goodness. If you missed that, you missed the rapture. You need to get a hold of that message. So good. So good you can get a hold of that. Just a great word from God. Also of David, that's where we're going today, and Samuel and the prophets. Verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms worked righteousness, obtained promises, and stopped the mouths of lions. Now, we could look at that, and we could see that that could apply to Gideon and Jephthah and Samson, right? We could see that that would apply to King David. They, they subdued kingdoms, right? The Moabite kingdom or the Philistines under Samson who, who worked righteousness. These guys did the right thing the right way. They did the will of God the way of God. They obtained promises. You know, God promises that our enemies would flee from before us. They'll come us in one direction and they will flee in seven directions. See, they obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of lions. Now, both David and uh, Samson, we know, killed lions. But what about Daniel, the prophet, right? Here he was in the lion's den and none of the lions opened their mouths at him. Next verse, verse number 34, we'll take a look at what it says. Quench the violence of fire. Once again, we go back to the book of Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were tossed into the fiery furnace. The people that tossed them in died because of the heat, and yet they were untouched by the flames. Escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turning to flight the armies of the aliens. Once again, this could apply to any of these great men that we see in this list. And today, as we take a look at this, we see these men, and all of these men had something in common. Yes, they did great and mighty, wonderful things for God, but also, all of these men had glaring flaws in their life and in their character. But you know what? Despite our failures and our flaws... We can still move forward with God and do great things through humble faith. 
See, we could have a laundry list of all these guys' failures, all these guys' flaws, Gideon's fear and Samson's affinity for women, right? Yeah, we, we even see the great prophet Samuel didn't rebuke his sons, didn't restrain them. David has huge flaws. We're going to talk about some of those things today. And yet, God still used them to do great and mighty and wonderful things on the earth. See, despite our failures and flaws, we can move forward with God and do great things through humble faith. Now, we've got to define then what is humility. If we're going to have a humble faith, if we're going to believe God in humility, what does humility mean? Because there's a lot of humble that's out there about what humility really is, right? And, and, and I don't want that baloney from the world. I want to know what God has to say. What is true humility? I love what C.S. Lewis said about humility. He said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but rather it's thinking of yourself less. Let me say that again. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. See, in our lives, humility is simply this. It's depending on God. That's all. That's it. So simple. And yet oftentimes, it often evades us. We, we can't wrap our minds around that. But humility, true humility is just this, is saying, God, I can't do it on my own. God, I need you to come through in my life. God, I, I don't have the smarts. I don't have the wisdom. I don't have the education. But God, I know that you have a grace that empowers me to be able to do what it is that you've called me to do. And therefore, God, I submit myself to your will, to your plan on the earth. That's what humble faith really is all about. And we look at the life of David. I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. In the Old Testament, you'll find 1 Samuel chapter number 17. In 1 Samuel chapter number 17, we're going to take a look at probably the most famous story in all the Bible. Because even in the world, you'll find that when they talk about great victories in sports, you'll, you'll hear the underdog story, right? It was a David and Goliath situation. The little school from the backwoods of the middle America is coming up against the big city school with all the money and all the, the big beastly guys. And, and just like David and Goliath, and we've heard that all of our life, maybe you read a business book that talked about the little mom and pop shop that went up against Goliath, the big corporate entity that had all the resources and all the advertising and was taking up all the space, and yet they overcame. See, maybe you've never read this story in your Bible, but you've heard the name David and Goliath. It's an epic battle between good and evil. And today we're going to see what really made the difference. See, David was a warrior king, and David is regarded as the greatest king that Israel had ever known. David was the, really the first king of Judah and the, the first one that uh, really united both of Israel and expanded the kingdom. I mean, this guy did great exploits. He had great things going on. He was a poet. He wrote the most famous poetic works in the Bible. Psalm, the 23rd chapter, probably the most famous psalm of all, starting out says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. People paint it on walls and put it on pictures of beautiful scenery. This guy, David, had a heart for God. And yet David's life, as we read it in the Bible, is a roller coaster experience of extreme highs and extreme lows. We get to share in both of his triumphs and his tragedies. And this same poet, prophet, king who's highly regarded is the same one who committed adultery and murder. You remember the story of David and Bathsheba, right? Here David is, he's supposed to be out there going to war with the people. And what happens? He's up on the roof, kind of just relaxing taking a look around, see something that he likes over there, a little thing, taking a bath, Bathsheba's over there taking a bath, and he sees her and he says, ooh, I like that, right? And he, and he calls someone over and says, hey, yo, who is this over here? Go get her for me. And brings her, finds out it's the wife of Uriah the Hittite, commits adultery with her. Then realizes that she's pregnant, and so he decides he's going to cover it up. Oh, well, you know, if I can maybe get Uriah to come home, and maybe I can get him drunk, and maybe I can have him sleep with his wife. But Uriah was more righteous than that. He slept on David's doorstep. He said, how can I go be with my wife when the rest of my men are out there on the battlefield? No, I won't do it. So therefore, Uriah carries his own death sentence out to the battlefield. David tells Joab, I want you to put him at the front lines of battle where it's most heated, and then I want you to back off of him, essentially murdering Uriah. Wow. This is the same David, the same prophet, the same poet, the same warrior king who also got lifted up in pride at a time and decided he was going to number the nation of Israel, the, the fighting men. See, it was in the pride of his army rather than in the power of God that he was seeking to wage war. The Bible tells us that afterwards that he realized his sin and he repented before God and yet the consequence of it was that 70,000 men died in a plague because of what David had done. 
It's the same David who had too much blood on his hands to build the temple. And God said, no, you will not build the temple, but your son after you will build him. And yet, with all of David's failures, glaring as they were, this is the same David who now Jesus sits on his throne forever and who Jesus takes on the covenant name, the son of David, eternally. That's the same David. What made the difference in David's life? Well, it's the same thing that makes the difference in your life and in my life. It's simply humble faith. Are you listening today? Let me give you the backstory. okay? We're past the time of the judges. Now, all of a sudden, uh, Israel asks for a king. Samuel gives him a king. His name is Saul. Saul started out right. He was a good guy. He was small in his own eyes, even though he was very tall and he was very handsome. In fact, he was a head above the rest. The Bible says everybody else's head came up to his shoulder. And so this tall, handsome man unites Israel and has great things going on, and he, he starts to have victories and wins. And yet, he gets lifted up in pride. And he goes out and he accomplishes the will of the Lord, but he does it his own way. And there, he starts to operate in disobedience, and the kingdom is ripped from him. So Samuel goes and he anoints a new king. He goes to the house of Jesse, and he, he starts to look at his sons, and he thinks, well, this has got to be him, right? He finds Eliab, the oldest, and he says, this has got to be him. He's tall. He's handsome, just like Saul was. And God says, no, I've rejected him. You look on the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. And so he goes through all seven brothers, and finally he asks Jesse, do you have another child? Because, I mean, none of these guys are the one. And Jesse says, oh, yeah, you know what? I do remember I have another child. He forgot about his youngest. He's out there tending to the sheep. He says, oh, yeah, I got David out there on the hills, uh, Bethlehem. He's tending to the sheep. And so he says, go get him. I'll wait. So he sits down, and they go grab David. When David comes in, here's this young man. And as soon as he walks in the door, the Spirit of God speaks to the prophet, and he says, arise and anoint him, for he is the one whom I have whom I have chosen. And he anoints David there in the presence of his brethren. Now, if that would have been me, let's just take a journey for a moment, shall we? If that would have been you, you know what we would have done? We would have said, all right, boys, no more sheep duty for me. Eliab, yeah, you've been laughing all this time that I've been out there cleaning up behind these, these sheep. It's your turn, okay, brother? And then, and then the rest of you guys, I need somebody to carry my slippers. I need somebody to bring me the iPad in the morning so that I can catch the news and Facebook. And, and, and I want somebody to be my marketing manager. You know you're kind of good at talking about yourself. You're going to be talking about me from now on, okay? You're going to be telling people how cool I am. Uh, you're going to do my social media. You're going to be putting my face in the newspapers and, and on television and, and on T-shirts. All, and that's what we we would have done, right? We would have just got to work doing what we needed to do to make sure that our kingdom was secure. And yet, what does David do? David goes back to tending to his father's sheep. That was the kind of heart this guy had. He had a humble heart. Now, there came a time where the Philistines advanced against the nation of Israel, and there was a, a valley that they were encamped in. And the Philistines were encamped on one side, and the Israelites were encamped on the other side. And every morning for 40 days, a champion came out from the Philistines. You know his name. His name is Goliath. Goliath was a giant. You say a giant. How big was a giant? Nine foot six inches tall at least. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine? I'm six foot tall. So imagine three more feet and another half foot on top of me. That's how tall Goliath was. And so this champion comes out and he starts to taunt Israel every morning. And he says, send me a man that we may fight. And if he wins, then we will serve you. But if I win, you will serve us. And every morning, it's the same thing. He comes out and the, the Bible actually describes how much his armor weighed and how much, uh, you know, the, the tip of his, his spear weighed. It said that his spear was like a weaver's rod, big fat thing. And yet this guy was so huge and so muscular that he could handle all of it. In fact, tradition tells us that the warriors of that day, they would actually file their teeth down into points so that if they got into hand-to-hand -hand combat and wrestling match, they could bite somebody and tear their flesh and hopefully they would bleed to death. That's the kind of guy this was. So here he comes out. You can imagine this giant with pointy teeth, all this armor on, big old weaver's spear coming off of his back and he's saying, send me a man. And he's taunting the children of Israel. Now Israel, their king... The guy who was ahead above the rest, King Saul, he should have been out there saying, well, I'll come, I'll fight. The Lord was with me back then. You know, and I'll humble myself to the way of the Lord God. Empower me to go fight this man. He could have repented of his way. He could have went out, and yet he didn't. Saul and all of Israel's is shaking in their boots, sitting in their tents, running from him for fear for 40 days. Now, David's father, Jesse, 
sends David out to the battle lines. He's got three older brothers that are there. And he says, I want you to go and take some supplies to your brothers. And then I want you to bring back word from the battle lines of what's going on and tell me how your brothers are doing. So David goes out and he starts to talk to the people, finds his brothers. And we pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter number 17, starting in verse number 23. And we're going to read through verse number 28. Take a look at it with me. 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting in verse number 23. It says, and as he talked to them, David is talking to the guys, and he says, There was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. So Goliath comes out. David's talking, and all of a sudden he hears out there in the field, Send me a man that we may fight. The Bible says, notice, that David heard these words. David listened to what was being said. Verse number 24, it says, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. Verse 25, So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who's come up? They're talking to David. David's new, right? David hasn't heard this before. David finally hears this, and they said, Did you guys, did you hear about this, David? Do you see what's going on, David? Have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he's come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches. He will give him his daughter and will give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Sounds like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? Exemption from taxes. Some of you guys would go into a UFC match in order to get out of taxes, right? Hey, come on. I might, I might die trying, but at least I'm going to get out of some taxes, right? Verse 26. And David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, say, what? That's the new San Bernardino translation in case you were wondering. What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine? Say what? But look at what he goes on to say. And takes away the reproach from Israel. And takes away the reproach from Israel. And takes away the reproach from Israel. See, David heard what was going on. He saw the scene. And even though he liked the sound of no taxes and great riches and the king's daughter putting him in the family of the king, he liked all of that, but he said, but really what's important is not all those things. What's important is that there is a reproach right now on the people of God. And what will be done? Say, what about this guy who's going to take away the reproach from Israel? See, something was stirring inside of David. He was not okay with the status quo at this time. And he says, tell me, tell me more about this because I'm getting ready to do something here because this is bugging me on the inside. Look what it says, verse 27, I'm sorry, go back. He says, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Now, you guys don't know what that means. You would think that, you know, it just meant that there was something medically that didn't happen to Goliath when he was a young boy in the hospital, right? Now, if you don't know what circumcision is, ask your doctor, all right? They will, they will let you know about that. But most of you guys know what we're talking about, all right? And we're going to keep it clean in this place. But i got to go there for a second in order for us to understand what we're talking about. Why would it be important that David called him an uncircumcised Philistine? Why the big issue over such a little bit of tissue? Here's what it's all about. Abraham. Some of you guys got that, right? Tomorrow the rest of you will get it. So Abraham, when he was in relationship with God, talking to God, God gave him a sign of a covenant. A covenant is a binding agreement, the most solemn, sacred of all contracts that's given between God and man. And there had to be blood that was shed. So in the cutting away of the flesh, the skin, right, there was a, a shedding of blood that took place on man's part. Now, a man who is circumcised, every morning when he gets up, the first thing that a man does is he goes to the restroom, okay? Every morning, first thing in the morning, that man would have a reminder that he is in relationship with God because he sees the scar, the sign, the seal of the covenant. Multiple times a day, that same man, as he had to do his business, would remember that he is in relationship with God. It's very personal. It's intimate. It's private, right? This is my relationship with God. I am in covenant with God. It was the deepest part of him because that's a very sensitive part to a man, right? Therefore, David is not saying something just in the natural. He's saying this guy has no covenant. He has no agreement with the living God. So who is this guy who has no relationship with God to come and talk about us like that? That's really what David is saying. He's bugged. 
he's bugged on the inside, he's getting angry, he's getting hot. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? In other words, he doesn't have a covenant, but we've got a covenant. He didn't have a relationship with God, but we have a relationship with God. See, some of you guys have allowed the devil to talk long enough into your life. Some of you got allowed those that do not have a relationship, a covenant with God to speak into your life long enough. Why should you Christians be given your money? What, what is, what's wrong with you? Because you're just a bunch of bigots. You're a bunch of closed-minded, intolerant people. You guys need to sit down and be quiet. And we've been shaking in the tents and we've been allowing it to go on. And yet today I'm here to bug you. Today I'm here to stir you. Today I'm here to get in your face and say, who is that uncircumcised Philistine? to talk into your life like that. I'm not a bigot. I love everybody. And I mean everybody. I am not a homophobe. I am not concerned about your race, your background. I don't care about any of that stuff. I love you the same. But listen, I will not put up with the devil's junk in my life or in our church. You want to call me intolerant? No, I do not tolerate the devil's junk. I will not put up with that. People are dying and they're going to hell and I'm not going to sit idly by in the tent and let it happen. Not on my watch and not on yours either. See, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is the education system to talk into your children's life? You should be teaching them about God and about the right way. Oh, but we don't want to be closed-minded. Oh, yes, I do. I'm not letting the devil come and vomit in my brain. Listen, well, you Christians are brainwashed. You better believe it because my brain was dirty and it was gross and there was a lot of trash in there, but Jesus came and he cleaned it up. He washed my brain. See, once you've had an encounter with the truth, once you know the reality, you will not put up with anything less. Oh, come on, I should have had a bigger amen than that. Right, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. See, once you get a hold of it, man, you will accept nothing less. Don't water it down. I want nothing less than the maximum strength. I got to have it. I, I need it. This is what I want. This is what I breathe. This is what I eat. This is what I dream. This is what I sleep. This is what I wake up for every morning. This is what gets me out of bed every day. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine going to come and try and talk into my life? I'm a part of the army of the living God. If you ain't stirred yet, we'll stir you. Verse 27, the people answered him in this manner, saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now, how many of you know as soon as you start doing something for God, the devil's going to raise his ugly head? You're going to ruffle some feathers. You're going to rattle some cages. You're going to rock the boat. And people who are sitting in the tent chattering, they're going to get angry at you. Why? Because they wish they would have thought of it. Verse 28, now, Eliab... His oldest brother heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? You can almost kind of, this is the oldest brother, right? This is the first one who was passed up for being king. Why did you come down here? He goes on. And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? In other words, David, you should have been acting like king, but then you went back to the sheep. He starts to belittle him. Starts to put them down. Who did you leave those few sheep in the world, you little shepherd boy? What are you doing down here? Now all of a sudden he makes the attack personal. I know your pride and the insolence of your heart. For you have come down to see the battle. Listen to you guys. When you start to do something for God, people are going to mistake your confidence for arrogance. People are going to take a look at you and say, you're just, you're an arrogant Christian. Acting like you were the only one with the truth. Well, listen, it's not that I'm arrogant. I'm confident. I am the one with the truth, right? And I will make no apologies for it. Yeah, it may sound close-minded. Yeah, it may sound bigoted. But listen, I love you enough to tell you the truth. Not water down and patty cake and play games while you go to hell. No, I love you too much for that. If my children were out in the street playing games in the street and I saw a big Mack truck coming at them, I wouldn't be like, oh, honey, please come to me. Get out of the street. Uh-uh. What would I do? Hey, get out of the street. You want to be a little pancake out there lying on the ground? No, get out. Come on. I'd yell at him. Why? Because I know it's right and because I love him enough to tell him the truth. 
So here Eliab comes and he says, I know your pride. No, Eliab was probably the one filled with pride. Now, before we get too hard on him, I can identify with him. Because there's times where I've been bugged by things. There's things that have gone on, things that have happened around me. And someone else comes alongside. And you know what they say to me personally? This is what they say to me. They say, oh, shouldn't we do something about this, Pastor Dan? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man, yeah, we should have done something. I know your pride, right? And all of a sudden, we're pointing the finger back at them. Well, are you talking to me like that? You're the one who. <laughs> but David's right. See, Eliab should have humbled himself and said, you're right, David. Let's go take out this giant. I got your back, man. I got your back. Let's do this. No, he says, I know your pride. David, just like the youngest man, look at what he says. He says, what have I done now? I could, I could picture this is probably something David said throughout his lifetime, being the youngest of eight. Here they are in great grandma and grandpa Ruth and Boaz's house, and a lamp gets broken off the table, and all of a sudden all the boys have to line up, and all seven of them, did you do it? No. Did you do it? No. Did you do it? No. David's the only one that's gone. He's out playing with the sheep. They bring David back in. They say, David, why did you break the lamp? What have I done now, right? So here's David. He's out there on the battlefield. He's starting to to rise up, starting to say, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? Now all of a sudden he's being accused of pride and insolence and being told that he just wants to see a fight. David says, what have I done now? Look at this. Is there not a cause? See, if you weren't stirred before you came into this place today, think about this question for a moment. Is there not a cause? Aren't there people dying in the streets of San Bernardino every day, going to hell? Aren't our children being sold drugs and fed a lie each and every day of their life? Aren't we being just beaten and buffeted with advertising and media telling you that you're not good enough, that you're not skinny enough, that you're not smart enough, you need their product? Is there not a cause in the United States of America where it's going down the toilet fast? Listen, there is a cause of Christ. There is a cause of people. There is a cause of life. There is a cause of who you are in Christ. There is a cause that we need to roust ourselves. We need to shake ourselves. And we need to go out and take out some giants. God hasn't called you to cower in a tent. He's called you to take out the giants. See, not only did David's brother oppose him, but King Saul told David he wasn't able to do it. If you read this story, I would encourage you, go read this story at home on your own time. King Saul says, you're not able. You're just a youth. This guy's been a warrior since he was a youth. In other words, he'd been fighting longer than you've been alive. Some of you young people in this place need to hear this. You are not unable to take out some giants just because you're not old. And some of you older people need to hear this as well. You are not obsolete. And you haven't passed your purpose. All of us in this place together have giants that we're facing that God is calling us to come out of the tent and to go and take out. What, what, what was it in David? See, you've got to look past the permission of man and you've got to go to the promise of God. How did David know the promise of God? Because David was an Israelite. They, they were raised up in the word of the Lord. And there on the hills of Bethlehem, taking care of the sheep, he was singing songs to God. And he had a heart for the Lord. See, it's what David practiced in private that was rewarded in public. Tony Robbins said, what you practice in private will be rewarded in public. See, some of you guys got up this morning, you started to pray. Some of you guys were up late last night reading your Bible, trying to get some word in before you got to bed, even though you were tired. Some of you guys in the car ride, you're driving and you're singing at the top of your lungs to Jesus, hoping that nobody sees your tears as you cry before the Lord and thanking God no one can hear your voice cracking. And yet, what you practice in private, God is going to reward openly in public. Jesus said the things that are whispered in the inner parts will be shouted from the rooftops. And those who go into the secret place, God will reward openly. See, David had a personal heart relationship with Jesus Christ as he sang to the Lord on the hills taking care of his father's sheep and now God had called him to shepherd his people Israel and so Saul is telling him you can't do it he tries then then Saul tries to put his armor on him you can go out to battle wearing my armor see the world's going to tell you you can do Christianity but you got to do it this way and they will load you down with burdens that don't fit right you can imagine Saul's a, a head taller than everybody else and here he is with a youth right David is a youth at this time and it says that he put his armor on him. How disproportionate would that have been? I mean, David might as well went and got Goliath's armor and tried to put it on. And so you can imagine David looking like C-3PO trying to walk in that stuff, right? And, and, and he can't move. And he says, I can't go out in this. I haven't proven them. I haven't tested them. And so he takes him off. And what does he do? He grabs his shepherd's staff. 
And he puts on his shepherd's bag. Right? I would imagine it's a man bag. It's a purse, right? <laughs> a side bag, a tote, right? Fashionably in that time in Israel. And he goes out to the brook and he gathers five smooth stones. Because he's got a little sling that he's going to use. Now, some people read into this and they say, well, you know, there was uh, Goliath and he had four ugly brothers. And David knew he wasn't just going after Goliath. He had faith to take out the other four. Other people start to take a look at the cities of Gath and there were five major cities. And, you know, that was representative that David was going to take out the authority and the power of the Philistines. I believe David wanted a full clip going into battle myself, personally. That's what I think. You know, he's saying, man, if I miss with this one, I need four more just in case, man. That's what I would have done. And so David comes out to the Philistine. And in fact, the Bible records that Goliath had to look around to find David. You know, nine foot six, there's a youth coming out, and he, he finally spots him, and he sees this guy. And the Bible said David was ruddy and good looking. Some of you guys redheads in this place, you always thought you were ugly. Uh-uh, you're like David. You're ruddy and good looking, right? Somebody starts making the jokes. You say, uh-uh, I'm like King David, ruddy and good looking right here, right here, baby. Look at this red hair. God made this. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible says. And therefore, he comes out to him, and he's got his shepherd's staff in his hand. He's a little guy. And Goliath looks at him. He says, what am I, a dog that you send to me sticks? He says, I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to give your carcass to the birds of the air. Now, look at what David responds. David starts to speak faith. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse number 45. Then David said to the Philistine, you come at me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Look at the next verse, verse 46. This day, everybody say this day. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day, everybody say this day. This day. He says, I will give not only your body, but he goes on, he says, I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air that, and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. See, David lifted his sights from Goliath, and he lifted his sights up to the camp, but then he lifted his sights from the camp, and he lifted up to the Lord God of Israel. See, when you start to get in faith, and when you start to humble yourself under God's mighty hand, the Bible says that God will exalt you, that God will lift you up. See, you'll get a better perspective when you're in faith. You will get a better view when you're in faith, and you will start to be on top, and you will realize this is not about a giant. This is not about a camp. This is about God Almighty and His name being made famous on the earth. God wants to bring his purposes through your life. And the giant will try and stop that. The camp will try and stop that. But listen, it goes on, and it says this in verse number 47. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Notice David did not make any deals with the devil. Sometimes we think, man, if I just lay off church, maybe if I, I, I'm not such a witness on the job, they'll stop persecuting me. We think we can make a deal with the devil. The devil's crying out, and he's saying, if you'll just back off, if you'll just let up, I mean, I'll let up. Oh, no, the devil is a liar. Right? If David would have killed Goliath, do you think the Philistine camp would have served them? No. You can read it in your Bible. They ran away. And if he would have let them run away and said, wait, guys, I thought we had a deal, they would have come back and tried to fight again. Don't make deals with the devil. Some of you guys have heard the devil whisper in the middle of the night, you just screwed up again, and guess what? Now I've got you. You tell that devil to go to hell. Come on, somebody. We're too nice. What are you doing fellowshipping with the devil? He's a liar. He's the father of lies. And if he says, I've got you, no, he doesn't. God is greater and God is stronger. God is able to keep you blameless and preserve you until his coming. Never make a deal with the devil. Oh, well, I guess I messed up. I guess I'm going to have to. No, 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 no. You serve God and God alone. You may have lost a battle, may have fallen down, but get back up because God will give you the war. He will give you the victory. I got to run. I got to run. See, he came at Goliath with one thing. He said, yeah, he had rocks. No. Oh, he had a sling. No, he didn't. He had one thing, he had confidence. He had faith. He had a humble faith in the name of the Lord God Almighty. 
See, he said, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you, not with a rock, not with a sling, but in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And if that's all you've got is that one thing, that's enough. Remember, the apostles are talking to Jesus. Jesus says, who do the people say that I am? Well, some say that you're Moses, some say that you're Elijah, some say that you're the prophet. Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? Peter had one thing. Peter had a revelation from God, and he steps up and he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, whoa, Peter, yeah. Listen, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but it was my God, the Father, who revealed this to you. Flesh and blood didn't do it. God the Father did it. And he says, and I call you Peter. And upon this rock, upon Peter, because Petra means rock, right? So, so Peter has to be the rock that Jesus built his church on. No! Church was not built on Peter. Church was built on Jesus Christ. No other foundation could be laid except that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the rock. And he says, upon this rock, upon the confession of who Jesus is as Lord, he says, I will build my church. And he goes on to say, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Some of you guys are clapping, but let's get a hold of this. If all you had was the confession that Jesus is Lord, that is a one little stone that as you sling that, as it proceeds forth from your mouth, that is enough to take down the very gates, the authority, and the power of hell itself. Wow. See, all you need is that one thing, that humble faith in who Jesus is, that humble faith in the word of God which is able to save your soul. What's the name of your giant? Goliath? Oh, no. We got a lot of names, don't we? we got a lot of names. Pride, insecurity, lust, fear. We got a lot of names. Alcohol, drugs, poverty. It's a giant that comes out every morning and yells at you. Generational strongholds over your life. A lot of names of giants that come after us. Pornography. A lot of giants coming out and shouting, if I win, you serve me. And yet, all you need is that one thing. The confession of who Jesus is as your Lord and a humble faith in him that as you declare out of your mouth the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, that giant has to fall before your faith. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 57. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory. How? Through our Lord, Jesus Christ. See, that rock, as you start to declare it out of your mouth, as you start to sling it at your enemy, see, whatever that giant is when it comes taught to you, you declare the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, this giant must bow before me. In Jesus' name, I will not go there again. In Jesus' name, I have the victory. As you declare that and sling that out of your mouth, now all of a sudden, that giant will fall and God will give you the victory. Come on, somebody, give God some praise. Now, if you want to take out a giant, if you got the name of your giant, stand to your feet right now. There's a giant you want to take out, stand to your feet. Come on, I got my giant. I know what I'm slinging it at. Stand to your feet right now. You want to take out some giants? Let's do it. Let's do it together. You got your rock, Jesus Christ? Okay, lift him up. Lift him up. Lift him up. I don't want you to say this right now. Say, giant! Oh, come on. You got to get mad. You got to get bugged. You cannot allow this to go on any longer. You've let it go on long enough. Time to get angry. Say, giant, giant. I, come I come to you in the name, in the name of, the of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I declare, and I declare that you must fall, you must fall in, his in his presence and before my faith in him. In, in Jesus' name, in Jesus. I bring you down, bring you down. right now. This day. this day, amen, amen. and amen. amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now listen, remember after David slung that stone and Goliath fell, David ran up and he grabbed the sword and he cut off Goliath's head. 
And he grabbed a hold of it and he lifted it up for everyone to see. Camp of the Israelites and the camp of the Philistines. Now the Philistines were just shocked. And they started to run because their champion had gone. But I can imagine Eliab. Remember Eliab? David's oldest brother? David is a dead man. I don't know why I let him go out there, man. Dad's going to kill me. Oh, it was nice knowing him. And there he watches as David slings that stone. In shock, I can just imagine Eliab's jaw dropping as the giant falls to the ground. David runs up and grabs the sword and leans back. And he lifts up his head. And I can imagine Eliab just like grabbing the shoulder of the guy next to him. Yeah! 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 Get your sword! Get your spear! Come on, let's go! Let's wipe them out! Can you imagine it? Can you imagine it? Wow! See, your victory is for more than just you. Your victory is a witness and a testimony of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. See, David didn't take out the other four giants. David's mighty men did. One of his nephews did. It's amazing if you read the story. All four of them fell. But it wasn't David. It was David's mighty men. They saw David do it. And now they could do it too. So you guys got to go home and take out the Philistines. So you guys got to go home and get rid of some trash. You know what I'm talking about. Go get it out from underneath the bed. Go get it out of the closet. Go get it out of the pantry. Go get it out of the lockbox. Come on, somebody. Some of you guys got to delete some stuff off your phone and off your computers. Some of you guys got to turn it in. Hey, listen, whatever it takes. If your right hand caused you to stumble, cut it off. Some of you guys got to cut off some stuff when you get home. Got to delete that girl's number. Got to delete that guy's number. Why? Because they're dragging you down. You need to go out and take out the rest of the camp. See, we think in church... Oh, I just said the prayer, and now it's all better. No, the battle doesn't stop here. The battle starts here. Because you get to your car, Goliath is going to be sitting in the passenger seat saying, that wasn't real. <laughs> Come on. You know what happens. You wake up tomorrow, and you're going to have to go back to work. You're going to have to take care of the kids. What's going to happen? Goliath is going to be standing there. It's time to declare the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take him down and take out the rest of the camp as well. The work starts Amen. God is so good. Hallelujah. Everything I just preached, I'm going to ask everybody to remain seated. Just take a moment. Listen up. Listen up. Everything I just preached is for people who have a real heart relationship with Jesus Christ. That you are in covenant. You have that binding, close agreement. That doesn't happen because you came to church today and shouted. I wish it did. That would be so cool. Because then I could just get people to come and shout and then let them go and think that they're okay. But nothing could be further from the truth. You can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Sometimes people think if they do enough good or maybe if they volunteer in church or maybe if they were raised in church, memorize some scriptures or celebrate a holiday like Christmas or Easter, that they get to go to heaven. They're in right relationship with God. It doesn't work like that. Jesus said it like this. He said, if you want to go to heaven, you must be born again. Now, the world has made a mockery out of that term. I understand what they've said about it. I've read it on the internet. I've seen it in the movies. It's weirdo. It's crazy. It's all sorts of stuff. But listen, let's not let the world define for us what being born again is. Let's let the Bible do that for us. Listen, guys, you guys that are leaving, the only people that are leaving right now are the ones that are going to work the tents. The rest of you guys, stay put. Your eternal life is at stake right now. I don't want you to die and go to hell any more than you want that for your life. God loves you so much, he's holding up everything right now. Give you a wonderful opportunity to come into a right relationship with him. Doesn't happen because you sat in church. Doesn't happen because you were raised in church. Doesn't happen because you were good. It happens when you're born again. What does that mean? Beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. We prove it to you in the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Pretty gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. What's he saying? Lukewarm. What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again. 
an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. Today, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, and pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that. Bang. That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now, who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Today's your day, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this before, never said yes to Jesus? I'm talking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up. And I want to give you just a gift for a moment. I want you to zone everything else out. Just close your eyes and go into the realm of your soul. And I want you to check yourself out. Jesus said in the first chapter of Revelation that the time is near. That was written some 2,000 years ago. And if the time was near then, how much greater now? Jesus is coming soon. Maybe it's today. What if he came today and it was your last day? Would you make it to heaven? It only happens if you're born again. And if you're not, when Jesus comes for his own, you'll be left behind. Today, it doesn't have to be that way. You can make this choice. You can make this decision. Giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life. I'm going to count to three in a moment, pop my hands together. Front to back, left to right, back in the family rooms, I can see you guys. If you're out there in the foyer, watching by television, you're down to the Little Rock Cafe, come up with the burger down. You're ready to get your hand up. If you're watching online, wherever you're at, across the nation and around the world, this is your time. This is your moment of salvation. I'm going to count to three and pop my hands together. If you need to do this, get ready to get your hand up. Here we go. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. There's one, two, three, thank you. There's four, five, got you over there. Six, thank you. Seven, got you up there. Eight, got you over there. Thank you. On this side, nine, got you in the back. Thank you. Who else? Nine. Ten in the family room, I got you over there. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? There's ten wise people. If you believe I saw your hand, you can put it down. Ten, eleven up there, got you. Thank you. Twelve over there. I got you guys up on top over there. Anybody else real quick? You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. 13 over there. I got you. Thank you. God bless you over there. 13 wise people. If your heart's pounding out of your chest and you feel like the Holy Spirit's tugging at the heartstrings, come on. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. Let's go for God. If that's you in this place today. Anybody else? There's 13 wise people. Anybody else? Come on, let's go for God today. 13 wise people. Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Oh, got you back there. Thank you. Thank you for the wave. Got you right there. God bless you. God bless you. Okay. There's about 15 of you maybe that raised your hand. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout. Elijah's going to lead us in a song. As you hear him sing that, that's your cue. Get your stuff. Whatever you brought with you to church. Get a friend if you need a friend. Why don't you get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today. But we can't do that until we get you down here. So let's all stand and welcome them. If you raised your hand, or if you should have raised your hand, but you didn't, it's not too late. Come on down right now. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend from the family rooms. Get your children. Come on. Come on, let's go. That's all I know is everything I have means nothing. Jesus, if you're not my one. They're coming. Let's give my hand as they come. Everything I need right now. You can come too. I know is everything I have means nothing. Jesus, if you're not my one. from the foyer. From the top areas, come on, if you raise your hand, come on down right now. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on. They're still coming. They're still coming. You can come too. all I need is you right now. Come on, come on, come on. We'll wait for you. This is your time. This is your moment. I know is everything I have means nothing. All right, they're still coming. Come on. Come on. Come on. They're still coming.
Will you guys give me a minute? Can I have a minute? Is that okay? We don't have another service waiting for your parking spot, so we got some time here. Everybody can get out. But I just want to take a moment. I believe that there, there are those of you who still need to come. And, and there's a war going on on the inside right now. Maybe there's a giant yelling at you. You can't do this. Get yourself cleaned up first and then you can go and be a part of the church. You're too dirty, too ugly. You've done too much bad. And yet God says, come on, bring me your dirt. Bring me your ugliness. Bring me your bad. Bring it here to the altar and leave it here. Because that's the old man. You come and you're born again, there's a new man that's recreated on the inside. Spiritually, that old man is, is gone, washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're, you're, you're new. And you can't clean yourself up and make that happen. You don't have the power. That's what humble faith is all about, is that you submit to God's way, not your way. You're not going to make it in your own strength. And so I'm going to have Elijah sing that chorus one more time as he does. If the Spirit of God just spoke to you and called you out right now, and you know God just read your mail. Listen, God saw you last night. He knew what you were doing, and he's not in therapy over it either. He loves you. He loves you. He's not ashamed of you. Oh, if you could see the face of God right now, smiling and beckoning for you to just come. Oh, my goodness. It would overwhelm you. Will you come right now? Let's sing that again one more time. And will you come? Will you come? Come on. Come on. To come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with. Go back to the first one. He's going to sing the first one one more time. All I know is, as he sings that, you come. There's more. Come on. Come on. Come on. Go ahead and sing. It's all I know is. Everything I have means nothing. Will you come? Jesus, if you're not my one thing, everything I need right now. Cause all I know is everything I have means nothing. They're coming. Jesus, if you're you not too. my one thing, Everything I need right now Cause all I know is Everything I have means nothing Come on, don't clap if you need to come, Jesus, just come if you're not Come on my one thing. They're coming, come on, you can come too right Come on, come on Cause all I know Come on, you can come too The Father I loves you means Jesus, if you're not my They're coming. One Come on. Come on. The Father loves you. Everything I need right now. Come on. Because all I need. Come on. They're coming. You can come too. I have means nothing. There's room for you at the altar. Jesus, if you're not my one. There's a place for you at the table. Come on. You've been invited by the King. Because all I know. Everything I have means nothing. Oh, thank God you guys have come. Some of you guys are rascals. You waited. Waited to the end. It's okay. I'm stubborn too. It's all good. God loves me just the same. And God loves you so much. This is the best decision of your entire life. Right here, right now. Okay? So excited for the new life that's ahead of you. Now listen, listen. My friend right over here waving at you, black coat, polka dot. This is Pastor Joel right here waving at you, okay? He's going to do three things. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do, give you some free information, some free literature. Now that you're a Christian, what do you do next, okay? That literature, easy to read, 
It's free, and it'll help you to get your bearings. Now that I'm a Christian, what do I do? Third thing he's going to do, he's going to introduce you to a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Heard of a physical trainer in the gym helps you get strong? Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. Someone to come alongside you and help you so that you go on in the ways of the Lord. Don't go back serving the devil, right? You go on serving God for the rest of your life, okay? It's easy, it's free. He'll describe how it works and then I'll let you come right back out. Your friends and family will wait for you, okay? So if you guys will just make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise today. Hallelujah!